So all right then, uh, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us again for our Python for Full Stack Web Developers at Turning Your Ideas into Product Series. Uh, let's introduce our speaker, Katerina Hansen. Hello. <laughs> So Katarina is a senior engineering manager at Kojo, which is a procurement solution startup. Uh, she has multiple years of experience managing large product teams, as well as a background in project engineering. She advocates for a balance between agile and waterfall processes for a smooth project workflow with visibility. And I believe she also has two tuxedo cats. I do. They're asleep. Okay. <laughs> All right, then I'm going to hand the microphone out over you over to you, Katarina. All righty. So today, uh, well, may as well recap uh, the project so far. Um, what are we building? Um, we are building an open source menu and ordering system that is gonna tie into like delivery apps and client apps. It is open source, single tenant, peer to peer discovery eventually, um, but we're solving the problems of, um, you know, restaurants want to, uh, show their menus, take orders online, be discoverable, but uh, the big companies that currently do that take large, large chunks of money out of their pockets. So maybe maybe we can get something that they could host themselves and uh, save them a lot of money and do more of a community supported process here. Um, so project documents so far we've developed um, a PRD, product requirements doc, answering the question of what we're building. Um, we did a TDD, a technical design document, um, which is uh, how will we build it, define the approach, the interfaces, and technical specs. Did a work breakdown to enumerate all of the tasks. Um, and we developed yeah, something of a schedule, not the best schedule, but some guesses on how long it's going to take with dependencies and resources. Um, and that was out of Tom's planner. Um, some other project documents that we've gone over, uh, we went over the process flow diagram, which um, is, provides a flow chart of user activity through the tool. Um, and we're going to go over today wireframes, um, which is basically design, the design phase, um, and we also talked about architectural model database diagrams. I would say in any given project, these are the ones that are not necessarily re required all the time, but they can be helpful in explaining the content uh, to other people at your organization um, who need to get up to speed on what the project is doing. All right, where can you find things? Um, most of this is in my GitHub repo here. Um, I've got project document templates in there, the project docs that you can use as examples, um, and a whole set of like deployment tutorials um, are also available there in case you want to, you know, follow along, make your own project startup, do it again, um, <laughs> basically been, uh, documenting everything that I've been doing and setting this project up. All right, so the next part of this project is front end. And I will say, I will start off by saying, um, um, I started as a back end engineer. I started in Python. Python was the first language that like I ever really got. Um, I was convinced for a good long time that if everybody in the world would just learn JSON, like we could just all pass JSON around with Git and curl commands and we'd be really, really happy. Um, but since then, I've grown a little bit and, you know, good design and good front end is very helpful uh, in making things accessible. So, um, you know, usable, making people actually want to use it. So we're gonna, you know, I learned front end and now I'm gonna show you what I learned. Um, so designs, designs, the design part of a project can have a huge influence on the scope of your project. It can help or it can hinder delivery. Um, it is something of an art form to balance all of the priorities that go into, you know, 
an MVP. What's required? What's nice to have? What do we have the resources and the abilities and the skills to do? What are we going to have to go out and learn? What are we going to have to maybe buy? Um, there's a whole bunch of like decisions that go into making design. And as you can see, um, the Yale School of Art <laughs> kind of kind of made some interesting decisions there. Um, so in order, it, in terms of like minimizing the scope um, to an MVP project, uh, these are the basic rules that I try to follow. Um, first of all, like don't make every component a special little snowflake. Uh, be don't be creative with your user workflows so that your users have to learn a whole new user experience way of interacting with a website. Um, don't insist on pixel perfect placement of UI elements. Uh, don't use a lot of grids and then wonder why mobile web doesn't look good. <laughs> don't make everything user customizable in unique ways. Um, don't insist that every feature you've dreamed up is highly important to the project. Um, and uh, don't try to save time by not implementing full create, read, update, delete, um, or by unnecessarily cherry picking data. You're not really going to save time by saying, oh, we don't really need to delete that thing that we just created. So like, eh, you're just going to, you're just going to annoy people. Um, and, you know, leaving a field out isn't necessarily going to make things that much easier um, if you need it. Do use frameworks. Um, use, them, use them as close to base as possible if you're trying to go fast or with like very consistent modifications. Um, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, use normal workflows, introduce unique elements only when absolutely necessary, use flex, pay attention to your customizations, prioritize your need to have versus nice to haves, and always provide users a way to fix their mistakes and see their data predictably. All right, so as far as tools go for personal projects like this one, I usually just start with wireframes, um, I have a whole folder full of hand sketches of ideas that like I had an idea, I go to the paper and I just start drawing it out. Um, but, you know, more of the advanced design tools that they, they, they cost some money, but they're going to be really helpful for um, communicating with other people what it is you're talking about, um, rapidly prototyping things, um, you know, just giving a really good tryout. Um, I like Balsamic, um, Figma and Sketch are super popular. They're used fairly professionally. Um, in my experience, they have a higher learning curve and they cost more money. And unless it's in the hands of an actual designer, uh, it's, it, you probably don't need to start there for a project. Um, so I'm going to pause and give a little demo of the wireframes here that I have made for this project. Um, and uh, so this is balsamic. Um, it's fairly straightforward to make some wireframes. Um, this is basically a, you know, a browser component. And then you just kind of drag and drop things into uh, the page. And you know you can you can delete things, you can add other things. It's really, you know, just like really straightforward. Um let's see, I got eh, 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 common, common image. So the little image here. Right. You can make notes, you can drag stuff around. Um, it's really fast. And one of the real benefits of um, a tool like this is that it is a wireframe. It is really basic. Um, and people are going to focus on the usability more than like the design choices that are involved in uh, 
any given design. So um, yeah, I have a little login. Um, the first page that my restaurateur is going to land on uh, is going to be their menus. And so um, this is kind of like sketching out a potential way of entering in menus. Um, then I'm like, okay, you know, they're also going to have restaurant locations. So I'm going to need a different form. Uh, oh, I'm going to have to schedule the menus against the locations. How, how do I do that? What is that going to look like? Um, so like, this is, you know, an idea. Um, I don't know how actual feasible this is going to be to build, but it's using fairly standard components. So maybe. Um, I had an idea that like, okay, if I'm going to be doing uh, scheduling like this, it would be really nice to have a calendar that I could view the schedules on um, by like location and menu, maybe do some filters and then show, you know, like the schedule on a full calendar as a preview. So I, I can make sure that the information here is right, get a good visual representation of it. Um, I added a preview at the end of like what I think maybe the menu would look like would be as kind of a placeholder. Um, I've also got a, this is the restaurant builder versus the order manager. We have not built out the back ends for that. So the designs on managing incoming orders can probably wait, but I'm just putting a little placeholder button over here to remind myself that I'm probably going to need that at some point. But yeah, nice little components and such. Okay. Wireframe demo. Uh, no, view. All right. Um, so frameworks. One of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, is basically what kind of frameworks do we use? Um, typically, you you might you might know that you're going to start with React, but React doesn't come with everything that you need to build a front end website and, um, included. Um, it doesn't tell you necessarily how to handle data, although they do have hooks now, and that is is perfectly feasible to use hooks combined with another thing in order to do your data. But the other thing that it really does not do is um, provide you with a lot of CSS, pre-built CSS components. For that, um, you usually pick a framework. Um, I've tried a bunch of different frameworks at this point. Really, almost any framework will work. Um, I would say pick one. Don't mix frameworks. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is like have frameworks interacting with frameworks. Um, for this project, I decided to try Ant Design. Um, it's fairly new. I like the look. I want to try it out. Um, other good options, Material Design by Google, uh, Bootstrap. Starting to feel a little dated in my opinion, but people still definitely use a lot of Bootstrap. Um, it tends to be used pretty, pretty widely for like marketing sites. Um, I have previously used an early version of Semantic UI and I really liked it. Um, and they've come out with several new versions since the last time I touched it. So that is also an option for frameworks. Um, but I decided to pick Ant Design. Um, this is more or less what the components kind of look like in Ant Design out of the box. Um, yeah, they're fairly basic. They've got some nice rounded edges. They're pretty clear to look at. The buttons are, you know, not bad, kind of flat, but um, that's not necessarily a bad thing in design. Um, so I usually take a look at these, you know, key components that I think I'm gonna be using, make sure that they look like they will be usable for my purposes. And, you know, that's probably fine. Ah, so React, what does React actually do? Um, it provides a component hierarchy. Um, 
And so it is basically components. It will, com it will help you componentize your front end. If you're aiming to make um, like a, a, a form that looks something like this, um, in React, you're going to break it down um, into a number of separate components and subcomponents. Um, and then all you have to do is design like one of the little components, and then you can insert them into the higher level component. Um, and you basically make a little chain. You don't have to, um, you know, uh, redo, you can reuse all of these components. Um, nice, Tailwind is another cool framework. Um, so yeah, uh, so in this example, basically search is a component. Um, this uh, you know checkbox is going to affect the search, so it's probably going to be part of that. You've got a whole table here with your header, um, subcategories, fruits and vegetables. That's going to be a list input and then um, these are going to be like sub lists for the product rows underneath. Um, and that's basically how you'd break it down. Um, remember that components have props and states. Um, the component re-renders when the data changes. Um, the only components in the component tree, on, only the components that are in the component tree that are affected by the change should re-render ideally. Um, and so it's important to place the data change at like the right point in the hierarchy. Um, so that you don't have to re-render a tremendous amount of information. Um, and so this is like my attempt at a front-end technical design document. Um, so typically for inputs for doing your front-end design document, you would have um, your PRD, which will spell out the overall functionality, nice needs versus nice to haves. Um, yeah, uh, wireframes that help you break out the component hierarchy, um, the data flow UX should work, and uh, you can get really far with like placeholders and just the native CSS. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the detailed designs, you know, they're there to make it pretty. Um, they will provide you CSS specs and the final assets, but for um, like a prototype, uh, it it's probably not necessarily an immediately required input. It is required before you put it in front of people, um, but you can get pretty far uh, on uh, just just the base the base components, and that's probably where you want to start. Um, so high level, uh, the pages that I am making. Um, I wanted to have a router. I wanted to do login. Uh, login page is going to be not authenticated. Um, the register page is also going to be not authenticated. But then the main page and everything after that is going to be authenticated. So you're going to have to be logged in here in order to see it. And then um, the main page is going to be basically the header, footer, and then dynamic content. Um, and this is going to have routing. And so at the mid-level, we're going to see um, like the menu page, the location page, the calendar page. The menu page um, here is going to be split up into this menu list um, and then the form. And then the form is going to have inputs, a uh, submit button somewhere. Um, we want to have upload image. We want to have like a delete. Um, the location is also going to have a form. It's going to have some inputs, an image upload. And then the menu scheduler is going to be its whole separate form down here is what I'm picturing. Um, and then there will be a submit button somewhere here that I have not called out. Calendar is really going to be a nice to have. Um, so I'm going to skip that for now. Um, and so yeah, if you're getting into like the lower level details, um, we can call out the specific inputs. Um, we've got a title name, a section. Um, so we're going to need a hook in order to get sections, add sections, delete sections. And then the item subform, which is going to have get items, add items. And then those items are going to have name, price, and description. 
And so upload image, we're going to want upload, delete. We're going to want to submit menu. We want to create and update it. The delete menu is going to be delete. And then, um, yeah, this is like the nice to have. Um, it might need some special backend. I might have to do some calculations in order. I'm not 100% sure what the data format for this calendar element is going to look like. Um, it might be nice to do that type of processing on the back end and just have a special endpoint that my front end can call in order to get that you know, nice and formatted. Um, it probably needs a special, if not a completely custom component. Um, I did look into a few. These giant calendars do tend to be paid um, components, which is interesting, but um, there are definitely ways to like make your own. Um, more research is needed and some prototyping, which is why it is in the nice to have bucket right now. All right, so what did I do? Um, so this is going to be the demo. Um, all right, uh, so locally, we're going to take a look here. Um, if we're in the repository over here, and let me see if I can, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to zoom this in too far. Zoom. Is it that tough? No, that's too small. Okay. Um, One second. Sorry. I know. I know we like bigger fonts. Um. So, I have set up in the client um, folder, uh, basically a create React app um, app. And, uh, oh, okay, yeah, that'll work. I close all of this. Um, so create React app is a really simple way to bootstrap a React application. Um, you basically install um, a couple of things with NPM, and then you type like create React app and the name of your app, and it will make you a whole React skeleton. Um, there are still a few steps um, after creating uh, the skeleton to getting it deployed to AWS. Um, and uh, that was a bit of an adventure. Um, but uh, right now, the skeleton um, we have uh, is, is in this client app. And what we can do is run um, npm runs uh, npm run start in the client folder and get a local version of the application. And so uh, this is actually my local host, 3000. Um, and this is the register page that I have put together. Um, and it's basically, you can, you know, I made it so that you can register yourself a, um, yeah, uh, a user. Uh, registration's more for testing. I'm not sure that I actually want to keep it in a full production environment, um, but I'm just going to... Yeah, it should update. Um, I'm going to try, try this and then log back in there with that. Um, and so we've got a login. Um, and now I've got uh, menus, locations, and calendars. 
And as you can see, like the URL changes with the buttons. So we are doing routing. And each one of these is their own um, special page component. Um, so this is where we're going to build the specific page components. Um, and then there's a logout. And we can check and make sure that once you are logged out, uh, you can't go back to the menu page. And, you know, eh, that seems to be less than ideal. Oh, Katarina, there's a suggestion for the shortcut key in the chat. Control, shortcut key. Control and back apostrophe. Tick. Okay, that might work better. Yeah. I don't know. That doesn't seem to be doing anything. <laughs> I don't know. This is PyCharm. Um, so yeah, it's still JetBrains, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, OK. Well, so I'm going to have to check my authentication and make sure that it's properly clearing things here. But that was the uh, initial um, attempt here. One of the other things that I did add was um, a GitHub action. Um, and so uh, this GitHub action um, will deploy the client straight to S3, basically. Um, and so uh, now this is a new um, CI process that runs, um, it generates a build. Um, I actually registered um, a domain name um, and uh, pointed the domain name to S3, my S3 bucket that I am using to host the static website. And I pointed the domain name um, api.openrestaurantproject.com to the server to have, um, a, well, to the el elastic load balancer in front of the server. Um, to have a place to call the API. Um, and then, yeah, it deploys it to S3 and does a release now. So on push to main, off it goes. Um, and that is actually live right now. Um, and somewhat broken, but um, yeah. Uh, this is the register and the login and hopefully that will run and show basically the same thing. Here's my front end in the actual World Wide Web uh, pre pretending to be a real website. Um, and if we go to API, instead we should be able to see the API access um, <laughs> if you're here you're probably accessing the API directly and incorrectly, um, but you can view the Swagger docs if you want to. They are still here. And, um, and you can go take a look at the repository from here too. There's a direct link. Um, so yeah, uh, we can talk a little bit more about the components that went into this. Um, Basically, the entryway to the website is through index.html. Um, the index.html does not have that much in it, and it's fairly ugly. Um, but the key things that it does have is this div ID uh, equals root. Um, and then we have the index.js, which grabs the element root, um, creates a React DOM around it, 
And uh, we root.render the React app here in strict mode. And this is just a link to the app. This is the app in JavaScript. Um, one thing is, is that I got like super frustrated with um, with React uh, router. Um, I kind of hate React router, so I decided to try out Wouter, <laughs> which is W O U T E R, and um, it seemed like a very simple simple uh, routing program, like routing routing component here, um, and so. I have given it a try. And this is basically how you define your routes. Um, I define myself a specific private route in an attempt to uh, protect these, um, these routes. So this should uh, be able to either um, check to make sure that I'm authenticated. And if I am authenticated, route to the route that is a child or redirect you back to the login. Um, so that is in, in my auth. Um, and then if we go back to app, um, there's a number of different component pages. So I've got my login form here. Now the login form, um, is fairly basic. I'm using um, a, a React hook form, a controller form here to do uh, the controls for the form in input. Um, I've got a couple of input inputs and a button, and then some links to some other to the other places. Um, and then on submit. We basically call this function, which calls login with your email and your password. Um, and then login uh, is coming out of this use context, off context. Um, these are uh, state hooks. And so you can update your state in your uh, functions. So when the submit button is first pressed, we go ahead and we set loading equal to true. That way we have some time while it runs off to the backend to log you in. And then finally, uh, regardless of whether or not um, you know, it succeeded, you wanna, you wanna put loading back to false. And then here I've got the next page, um, which is basically like, if the next page changes, I'm gonna return you a redirect instead of um, instead of returning you this. So that's basically how I'm returning the um, the redirect component instead. Um, I found out afterward that uh, Wilder actually does provide a hook instead of an element. So I can probably make this more efficient um, in line here uh, than, than this little workaround that I ended up coming up with in Oh, you know, late at night. Um, but it seemed to kind of work for the purpose at the time. So uh, these are the different pages. Um, I have a very basic page for most of them. It's basically just placeholders for what is going to be um, more forms and more display. Um, so there's that. And this is the registration form as well. Um, I did play around with the CSS. Uh, one of the things that um, you can do is you, basically one of the habits that I've seen a lot of people get into is you put the CSS like right next to the page um, or the component that you're modifying. You call it the same thing, .css. Um, and then it's just really convenient to be able to you know, separate out your CSS, and then you can import your CSS right there. And then the CSS will apply to the whole, um, the whole component there and basically everything underneath it. Yeah.
So um, practically, when uh, running the project locally, um, you would basically uh, use the commands um, in the make file to run your server. Um, the server shows up in uh, your Docker container um, here. So um, you would see um, here I've got my web and I've got my database under Women Who Code Full Stack Web Dev. Um, so these two containers are what is running the server. And then in order to maintain kind of like the speed of iteration and your ability to kind of control things, um, you just run the local client, uh, you know, on your, your desktop. And so uh, it would point to your backend server in the Docker container. I also added um, both linting and prettier, uh, which has been um, both fantastically annoying and keeping my code, you know, prettier and more more error free than it would normally be. Um, so that was a bit of an exercise as well. Um, that is what these um, prettier RC and prettier ignores, and then lint. Um, ES lint RC and ES lint ignores are kind of doing. Um, it'll ignore some stuff, but it's it's going to check the rest. So uh, that's been fairly strict. Any? Yeah. Oh, we had a question so, from Hope it. in the chat. Hope. Can I click the link above the compilation? Which compilation? When was that uh, link in my terminal? Oh, this one. Yes. Um, so like, there's localhost. And I'm like, hmm. and one of the good things to do here is like inspect the console. Okay, so this is private route, you are authenticated, cool. That's a warning. I should no longer be authenticated. I go straight to menu. It is here. And it's definitely not showing me the authentication, but hmm. yeah, I'm a little, uh, let's troubleshoot the link was slightly different. Uh, the on my network, this one. Yeah, that's just my that's just my local IP. Um, the design doc uh, is currently just on the um, the slides and the wireframes. I have not exported yet, but I will add them to the repo. Any other questions? Oh, we have one question in the chat. Um, they're asking, have you some recommendations when starting to make the wireframes? Um, yeah, I mean, basically I, I will go research and like look at other websites that I kind of want to see that they might be doing something similar um, to kind of get a sense for how somebody does like the UX of things. Um, 
things like logins tend to go through trends. Um, so it's usually fine to just be like, okay, like what is the, you know, the tr basic trend right now around logins? Um, seems to be a couple of passwords, you know, the email, um, and uh, then, yeah, like after that is basically thinking about the functionality, the functionality that you're trying to accomplish. Um, most of what um, I've probably done a lot of working on tends to be collecting data through forms and then displaying it in one form or another. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's data in, data out. <laughs> And yeah, that was just that was just localhost. Um, if I uh, deploy it, basically, if I push to main right now, um, then my GitHub action is going to kick in, and um, these ones are going to run. And then you can kind of see it um, deploy to uh, um, upload the build you know, the zip artifact and stuff like that. It does zips of the builds and deploys things. So this runs, and then that is how I got it behind the um, open restaurant project on the actual internet. But yeah, um, definitely the the wireframes are a really good good place to work out work out UX and ideas if you think that um, you know if if you're having trouble like the menu schedule right here I've got something I've been thinking about it I'm like okay. I'm, you know, I want to be able to set it active. I want to be able to pick the days of the week. Um, I want you to be able to skip days of the week. So it really does have to be one day per week. Um, you know, like, I don't remember why I said open closed, but that might have been, you know, if I select here um, and that is, you know, selected. Um, I don't remember why I had two buttons, <laughs> but I put them both in there for some reason. Um, oh, it was probably to like set it for vacation versus setting it, setting your hours or something. Yeah, Figma's. If you've got access to Figma and you wanted to do wireframes, I would actually move over to FigJam if you can. Um, Balsamic is like super, super easy and straightforward. Like um, if I want to, you know, um, Trying to find Fig Jam by Googling, but it's still by Figma. <laughs> it's it's by Figma, but it's it's their easier um it's their easier one. So if you have access to one, you might have access to the other, uh, which is really nice. Um but yeah. Right. So like. I'm going to have, you know, two passwords, password again, password again. Here's my email. Uh, here's my last name. Here's my first name. Um, so yeah, like, boom, wireframe bit. Um, register, you know, here, um, or if like you already have it, maybe you know, back to login. Um, and it's it's actually very full featured. I am not using anywhere near the feature set that Balsamic has. You can um, 
you can actually make it very interactive. I could link this to my other wireframe. And then when I click on, uh, shift click on that. Come on, why do none of my keyboard ones want to work? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's because you're in a presentation, that's why. It's gotta be because I'm in a presentation. I don't know why any of my keyboard commands aren't working. Um, you have cats though. Maybe they were sleeping on it um, when you weren't looking. Probably. I have never worked with Mural. So I don't know what mural is. Oh, I think there's yeah. another question before um, Diana's question about mural. Let me see if I can scroll um, up. Do we need to use external resources in our code to make online ordering possible? Um, yes. Yes, eventually there will need to be external resources used. Um, there's a number of companies that kind of cater to the things that I'm looking to do though. Um, and part of what I'm hoping to do is just uh, wait until somebody tells me <laughs> what it is that they use in order to do orders um, for that type of integration. Um, specifically things like credit cards and, um, you know, debit cards, uh, you don't want to handle those at a startup and definitely not um, at this stage of anything. So usually you partner with another company, they give you some code to like drop in the front end and then they will handle um, credit cards and tokenizations and all of that. Um, so yeah. Uh, you really want to handle as minimal amount of that as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, but <laughs> setting up the rest of it first is kind of like 95% eh, of the work. Um, the payments tends to be a neat little add-on on top. But yeah, yeah. Um, additionally, restaurants sometimes have their own, um, like they may have their own merchant ID and things like that. Um, so if they have their own merchant ID, um, then that makes integrating with a number of different other payment services a lot easier. Um, and so there's, because they're going to be hosting this, you can basically build um, optional plugins that they can turn on as they're setting up their hosting environment to hook into a number of different payment um, providers. And because it's open source, part of that would be like, okay, like, you know, um, you, can, you can totally do that. You can go right into the code and set up your own, um, your own payment integration if you need to. But yeah, we don't we don't fool with credit cards. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, it is six o'clock, and um, I might be actually out of content. <laughs> Oh, maybe, did you do a recap of the previous sessions, Katarina, for folks who may have just joined us for the first time? A full recap? <laughs> um, a quick recap. A quick recap. <laughs> uh, previously, we have been working on um, basically the back end. Um, so back end, uh, we stood up a Python Django server. Um, we made a set of models. Um, 
So uh, these are the models that I have created. Uh, I'm using Jenga REST framework. So we put some serializers on top of that. Um, and then a couple of neat little validators. Um, and then uh, serve them to the front end here. Uh, they're all very similar. It's all very basic because we're basically bootstrapping everything. Um, so as we kind of figure out, you know, what we need, what we don't, we can edit this. But um, I found generally a model view set to be more or less everything that, you know, you need to kind of get started bootstrapping things. Um, we did admin. Um, we did uh, authentication with... Um, mm, yeah, uh, there's authentication endpoints here, off use, there we go. Um, so uh, using a uh, register API view serializer with the admin user serializer here. Um, I remember that. Uh, where'd all my REST framework auth token stuff go? Um, I mean, nine tenths of it is in the settings of Django. Um, and then uh, we stood up a Docker environment with um, Docker file and Docker compose. So this is what we use locally. Um, and then uh, use GitHub Actions um, to deploy uh, the server and de now we can deploy the front end and um, did a whole huge deep dive into AWS um, around uh, standing up an EC2 instance, an RDS instance, um, an ECS uh, container service and repository, um, and then all of, all of the other things there. Um, the repository itself, has a number of um, different uh, pieces of documentation. Um, so you're free to look at that. Um, and uh, a number of like straight up walkthroughs here um, on how to set up an Amazon uh, you know, service, basically, if you ever need to. Um, don't need to do it for this project, but if you want to do it for another project, uh, there should be a lot of good information and walkthroughs in there. Um, and then also there's a uh, project doc templates. So for the like the PRD, if you ever need to do a PRD, this is a you know like not a terrible template to get you thinking. Um, And then the actual project documents um, that uh, for this project. These look great, Katarina. Great job. Yeah. Like getting all this like back end and front end and like everything prepared. Um, oh, we got follow up question chat. Yeah. Um, so, kind of for you, it's, uh, someone's asking why did you decide to learn or move to I guess front end from your original programming. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time doing back end, and then uh, I probably just, I think I just had a friend who was like really, really passionate about front end and <laughs> convinced me that it was worthwhile. Um, for a good long time, I was like, you know, the front end people get a new framework every six months and then they want to redo the whole website. And like, I don't know if it's even worth really looking at. Um, I had tried it a few times. I didn't like it. Um, but I was like working with like knockout JS and some other terrible frameworks, you know, like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, once, once the front end community kind of settled on react for a while, 
And I was like, okay, that's looking like actually somewhat stable. Um, it's worth, uh, it's worth playing with. Um, let me go see how that works. I want to learn how that works. Um, that's when it kind of like started to gel a little bit more. Um, and, uh, now I can make some terrible engineer designed, um, front ends that, you know, you can, you can, they are functional and they are boxes and they're usually blue. Um, <laughs> but, but I can get something working and then somebody else can come in and make it look better. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, just enough to be able to call myself an actual full stack developer. If somebody else is, you know, set up a front end, I can usually go in and help fix it. But um, <laughs> uh, like I even I even took an uh, online design course at one point um, to try to like, you know, learn some more design. And from that, I learned that um, you should line things up lining things up is very, very important. Um, so wherever you can say, oh, that lines up with this, that lines up with that, the more lines you can make line up, the better it's gonna look. So <laughs> very important. It's a follow-up question I can ask too, Henry. I know some people have mentioned, uh, you know, they're building their own app, they have an idea. And I know like this one to you was an idea. So like, what was your thought process? Like, you know, kind of, fleshing it out and saying like, okay, we can, this can actually come to life. Um, I don't know what Bible is this plan, but like we can actually make this into an app. Like how did you, I guess, your thought process or decision making, make an idea into an app? Make an idea into an app. Um, I mean, I guess like if, if you've been doing web de development um, for a while and you kind of like understand it really well, then every problem becomes a nail and you can take the hammer of web development and just kind of smack it and see what comes out, um, whether or not it would help. Um, so yeah, that's that's more or less my, my goal with this project is like, I, I see a problem. I've heard people say, you know, like this is a problem for them. And I, I'm like, it feels to me like web apps are causing the problem. And I kind of want to see if a web app could fix the problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very idealistic of me. Um, yeah. Uh, online design course. Um, I I probably took three or four of them through Udemy, and if you you want the links, I can send them to you. Just hit literally hit me up in in the Slack channel. <laughs> yeah, and they're like uh, I think we have a, a channel from uh, um, the mm -hmm. Web Dev Python. Um, yeah, yeah. Post remind, it earlier in the chat. Let me see if I can find the link. Remind me, and I can send you links. There we go. Um, web hyphen, dev hyphen, study hyphen, group. I'm not sure whether it's dash or hyphen. So now I'm just like hyphen, hyphen it every <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, that was like a quick session. Like, great job, Katarina. Just going over the flash. Like, it's, it's usually something we hand over to the designers, right? Like you say, with our team, and like they take on the role of like creating the wireframes after you like. Said, this is what this does this is like you know as you the back end say okay this is where the data goes but like if you understand yeah. like both sides and like it's easier to have that same vocabulary and conversation like no matter which side of the table you're on instead yeah. of like you know going into a, what they call it, like a black box the, the magic box and you don't know which side the rabbit's going to come out I, <laughs> I love you know opening up the black boxes and looking around and making sure i understand what's going on in there mm -hmm. Um, so like, it's definitely been really helpful in managing, um, teams to have like, uh, full stack experience. Um, I manage, uh, teams that are both front end, front end and back end. Um, I've not yet managed an infrastructure team or a platform team, but I have managed data teams. Um, so like having a good understanding of what my team is working on is really, really important. 
Um, and so on like an almost daily basis, I work with designers and I'm constantly like, you know, hey, could we make that more efficient? Can we make that more efficient? Like this user work, you know, it looks pretty, but like, let's get the user workflow right. Um, this is an MVP. What can we cut <laughs> to make it easier? What can we use that we already have? What components can we share with other people so that their stuff goes faster? Um, it's a lot of like, you know, similar questions. And so, um, you know, yeah, keeping it fairly simple um, and straightforward for the first iteration. Um, I remember like my first project ever, uh, I was making a PDF writer and my goal was to get um, a page, a single page with black text, size 12, Helvetica on the page, one word. <laughs> That was my goal. And I'm like, okay, done. And then like from there, it like exploded. So, um, you know, it's really easy to, once you, you know, kind of like strip the problem down to, you know, the bare essentials of what it is you need to like do the rest of it. And so this is very much like skeleton work in a lot of ways, right? Like it's this, it's almost the stuff that like I would do for any project. So just kind of getting it out of the way so that I don't repeat it. Um, like I don't have to like, uh, it, solving those types of problems once means that you get to solve the interesting problems more often. Um, but yeah, I always kind of get stuck down like, you know, oh, let me set up routing. Let me set up authentication. How do you log people in? <laughs> Um, and then not get to the meat of the project um, for a while. So yeah, uh, part of my hope is to help provide um, the skeleton framework so you get through that a little faster as well. I think yeah, with a technical project manager hat, I'm like, if we already built something similar to this that already exists and we just tweak it, then we can utilize it for this new Mm -hmm. solution and like oh the data is already being used here um but yeah it's mm -hmm. I, I know it's like it's it's uh I, I have that inner like thing too where it's like a problem i want to solve it in a new way um but you know it's if it already exists <laughs> it's like do you want to recreate the wheel or not but yeah i know it's that it's that itch <laughs> yeah it's it um yeah. oh, oh, we have uh one last question i think and then we'll wrap it up for tonight sure, um sure sure I'm not sorry, uh, Diana, they're asking, I think it's like more career question. Like if you're yeah. asking, if you're applying for a leadership position, uh, do you think you need more technical experience rather than soft experience? Uh, I think you like kind of, you're more like a senior engineering manager. So obviously you do need like the technical experience. Um, yeah. So, so um, I would say most managers that I've met were engineers at you know, the higher levels of the engineering organization. And they kind of just got pressed into management. They're like, you're, you're the person who happens to be here um, and we need a manager. And so now that's you. And um, if that person does not want to be a manager, that's not really great. Um, I think that they need to understand that management is a different job um, and that there are different skills that they will need to be good at management. Um, it is not uncommon for engineers to become managers and then go back to engineering and then like give management another go and take a couple of times flipping back and forth before it, they really decide, you know, whether they want to commit to management. Um, I uh, probably had more soft skills than your average engineer when I became a manager because I had a whole separate career prior to software engineering that I was leaning on. Um, so I switched into software fairly late and I had done a lot of project management work um, for like the decade before I switched into software. Um, so that really helped me kind of level up quickly because I already knew how to do problems and solve problems and do projects and you know work with others and work cross-functionally and get stuff done and push on people. Um, <laughs> which is also a big portion of uh, software engineering. Uh, but I had to learn all the tech. So I did some, you know, basically just self-taught um, a lot of the, the back end and then the front end um, in order to get, you know, enough technical understanding 
to the point where I was effective at building things. Um, and I love to build things. So um, yeah, uh, now um, I view it more as like building organizations. So uh, that's <laughs> also a lot of fun <laughs> for me. Um, that's great. Yeah, I think there's also um, kind of middle role now. They call it like a senior staff engineer, right? Where yeah. they're also like a people leader, but they still get like work done. Cause it's just yeah. a lot of like different expectations and capacity like in the role. So. Uh, we have we have senior staff, we have TLMs, so like technical leader managers, um, it's just kind of like a junior engineering manager with more, you know, more on the technical side, kind of stepping into management. Um, and uh, yeah, like definitely, you know, you can be a leader and you can still be an IC, um, so individual contributor, uh, but it is not a requirement to go into management in order to get promotions by any means. Um, a lot of uh, companies need people to lead from the individual contributor side as well. It depends on like the type of company, right? So yeah, oh, this is great. Um, thanks so much everyone for all awesome questions and attending our session tonight. And Carrie, thanks so much as always. You're taking like this huge like bulk of content. I feel like you rewatch your videos like over and over again just to, like people <laughs> to download and like this like distill all like information. Like you said, like it's a lot. So like if people kind of like feel unsure that they can't keep up, like there are the recordings and you are available like in the Slack community and and sir, um, yeah. any follow up questions. And it's been a fun project, right? Saying like actually building an app and like I don't know. I'm just gonna say <laughs> Kenry, I see it like being used like. <laughs> So to be yeah. fine, I think, uh, yeah, you're in Oakland, right? So there are a lot of like food trucks, so. Food trucks, like right? Soul. Like, yeah. where are you gonna be? Let me know when you're <laughs> gonna be open so I can go down and get. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> I know, I know. And I don't want, I don't want the big companies taking 40% of the profits on these restaurants. Like that's ridiculous. No. Right, yeah. That's so. ridiculous. They don't need to, this is not that hard. <laughs> it's a good open source app. So yeah, yeah looking forward to it. Um, all right, so let's wrap it up. Uh, thanks everyone for joining tonight. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.